This is Anjum Chowdhury. He was recently in prison for five and a half years for encouraging support for ISIS. But can preachers of hate really motivate people to join groups like ISIS? For some years now, I've been studying the psychology of extremism and intergroup conflict. This started for me here in Papua New Guinea. I went there to live for two years deep in the rainforest with a group that had a long history of warfare. And there I found that uh, extreme beliefs were not motivating for fighters. What motivated them was actually an extreme kind of love born out of sharing traumatic ordeals. We all have intense experiences in life that shape who we are today. And when those kinds of experiences are shared with others, it can be incredibly bonding. Now, is that the kind of psychology that lies behind extreme pro-group action? To explore that issue, I teamed up with social psychologist Bill Swan at the University of Texas. Swan had developed a measure of identity fusion, where he showed people a small circle, that's you, and a big circle, that's your group, and invited them to choose which of those representations best characterized their relationship to the group. And those who chose the one on the right are said to be fused. To understand fusion, it helps to appreciate that we all have a personal self, aspects to us that are unique personally, but we also align with groups. Now, social identity theorists have long shown that when you make the group salient for many people, it makes the personal self less accessible. It's depersonalizing. But with fusion, it's really different. If you're fused with a group and it comes under attack, it really feels personal. And our idea was that this kind of psychology lies at the core of extreme pro-group action, including suicide bombing, for example. Now, to explore our ideas, we need an appropriate environment. Oxford had lots of infighting, but not enough fusion to generate outright warfare. So we went here to Libya in 2011. Here, one of my students, Brian McQuinn, is showing me round a once crowded, bustling marketplace in the heart of Misrata, which Gaddafi's forces often used to hide their tanks, in this case, ineffectually, from NATO airstrikes. Look at this. This is a, an impromptu memorial to the dead. Uh, wall upon wall of young men and boys who laid down their lives in this conflict. And it was this extreme kind of personal self-sacrifice that we wanted to understand. So we developed a survey that we ran with uh, fighters in the military battalions, the revolutionaries. And we asked them, we measured fusion with various groups, and half our sample were frontline fighters, and half our sample were providers of logistical support to the frontline fighters. So they drove ambulances, they repaired vehicles, that kind of thing. And here's what we found. Ceiling levels of fusion with family, with uh, members of your katiba or battalion, with fighters from other battalions you didn't know personally. But look, floor levels of fusion with those who shared your beliefs on the same side ideologically and support the revolution, but who weren't part of your fighting groups. OK, so we said to people, we get that you're fused with multiple groups. But if you had to choose one, which would it be? A forced choice question. And what we found here made, it made a big difference whether you were a frontline fighter or a provider of logistical support, even though both were members of these battalions together. If you're a frontline fighter, you are far more likely to choose your fellow fighters over even your family members. Now, our preferred hypothesis was that it was because of the intense fusion of frontline combat that they were this uh, tightly fused together. The alternative would be that it was fusion that sent them to the front lines and got them there in the first place. To adjudicate on that question, we developed a large survey with US military who have seen conflict in many different parts of the world, and we measured fusion levels with them as well. And there, here we found, and the key thing here is they had no choice over their deployment. And here again, it was intensity of frontline combat that predicted fusion with each other. So a take home for me from this is that curtailing freedom of speech may do little to uh, address intractable conflict. In fact, it could make matters worse because it produces yet another threat alongside the bombs and the bullets that fuses already embattled groups ever more closely together. I think instead of arresting preachers, we should really be focusing on the core issue here, which our research suggests is this sharing or perceived sharing of um, extreme dysphoria. Uh, every time a hospital is bombed, every time a drone strike misses its intended target, another cohort of potential extremists is created. Thank you.